welcome again. It's time for Diary with Physicist Farm Gal, and this is episode number 26. My name is Deborah, and I'm coming to you from my family farm here in the foothills of the Arkansas Ozarks, where I like to do all the crafts. I like to knit, I like to crochet, I like to sew, I quilt, I make jewelry, I make baskets. I'll try any craft once and twice if I like it, as you can tell from the state of my craft room. Um, I am also a professor of physics and astronomy at a local university where I teach majors classes, I teach general education classes, and I also work with students on undergraduate research projects. My background is in astrophysics, and I also teach modern physics, and also teach about being a public scholar in science literacy. Uh, so I like to share some things about science also. And last but certainly not least, I'm a third generation family farmer at least third generation that I know of. We may go back a lot further than that. Uh, I live here on 170 acres, which is my family farm uh, now. It used to be quite a bit bigger, but over the years it's gotten smaller and smaller, as often happens on family farms. But I raise grass-fed beef cattle, I raise horses, I have heritage poultry, I have show-quality rabbits, and I have a retirement herd of donkeys, miniature donkeys, miniature horses, and a miniature mule named Pumpkin who thinks she rules the roost. And as you can see from my sweet little co-host Willie here, I am fur kid mom to 14 dogs, six indoor cats, and an undetermined number that is greater than 16 of outside barn cats. <laughs> so if all of that sounds interesting to you, I hope you to hang out here and visit with me. I want to welcome back all my returning viewers, and if you're a new viewer, welcome to the Funny Farm. I hope you find something that you enjoy listening to. So we're going to jump right in here with a Diary of a Physicist Farm Gal, episode number 26. Okay, if you're looking for us on social media, you've obviously found my YouTube farm channel, which is Buckthorn Farms. That is the same as my farm Facebook page. If you want to follow my Facebook page with my farm stuff, I post about my making and also farm articles, articles about homesteading. Um, I also share some of the things that I do like canning or raising animals, so I encourage you to go over there and check that out. Uh, also, you can find me on Ravelry as Doc Firewoman, and I'm also on Instagram as Doc Firewoman. Uh, there is a Ravelry group for the podcast, Diary of a Physicist Farm Gal, in the forums section, and you can go there to find about find out about giveaways or uh, make-alongs. I have a question and answer thread open currently, and I'm also going to be doing a winter solstice progress keeper swap where we can exchange progress keepers uh, for the winter, various winter holidays that people may observe. Um, I thought progress keepers might work well because they're small and they are might be easy to put in an envelope and we could exchange cards. It's kind of fun to get stuff in the mail, so maybe we could do that. If you'd like to sign up for the progress keeper swap, there's a thread that's open. You don't have to post your address publicly. Uh, you would mail that to me privately. But I just want to know how much interest there is. And you can exchange with one person, you can exchange with five people, or you can exchange with as many as possible. Um, so all the details are on that forum post on the Ravelry page. Also, you can go there to find about, about the two make-alongs that are currently going on. The first one is the Share the Warmth make-along, where we are aiming to make items for charity that bring warmth, either literal warmth or figurative warmth to people. They can be hats or mittens or scarves, maybe for a homeless shelter or a battered women's shelter. You might make toys for a battered women's shelter. You might make blankets. You might make things to donate to an animal shelter. You might make things to donate just to someone that you know that needs a little love and kindness right now. So I'm all about spreading some love and kindness wherever possible. Um, so that make along in, ends December the 15th and I will take any craft, sewing, knitting, crocheting, qu quilting, weaving, I don't care. Just do something to spread the warmth and spread the love uh, because that is something that is desperately needed in this world right now in my opinion. The other one is the I Am Worth It make along. The I Am Work it, Worth It make along is where we are making something for ourselves. It is a participation only make along. There will only be one thread. You do not have to finish your object that you're making, but you, you do need to start something for yourself. And as I have said several times when I have described this make along, you can't pour from an empty cup. 
okay? You can't pour from an empty cup. In the holidays, a lot of times, empties people's cups or uses up their spoons or however, however you want to say that. But the holidays, although can be very joyful and full of wonderful family things, they can also be a time that taxes people in a way, whether it's they try to put on the perfect holiday event, or maybe there's a lot of family, and maybe there's some dissension, or maybe they're lonely. Maybe they're alone at the holidays, and they need, and they feel sad. Um, you just never know people's stories, and we're going to talk more about that uh, toward the end today. But, um, so it is the idea of let us do something kind for ourselves. Let us m use that special yarn or make that pattern or pick up something that we put down. Uh, whips are allowed, any craft, I don't care. Just do something for yourself, okay? Uh, we do already have some prizes for that that I have shown in the past, but I'll quickly flash a couple of them up there. We have some more on the way, but... Um, this is a beautiful uh, yarn bowl bag from April 9 Designs on Etsy, and it has beautiful horses on it that she kindly donated. She jumped right on there when she saw that I was doing this. And then also here is some um, yarn donated by Sparky136 on Ravelry. She was kind enough to donate these two skeins of yarn. So um, we will be giving those away, and that make-along runs through the end of the year. So you have until December 31st to get in on that chatter thread. The more y'all chatter, the more entries you have, or uh, abilities, uh, opportunities, that's the word I'm looking for, opportunities to win a prize. Uh, there will be some other uh, prizes uh, coming in. Um, I'm headed to a fiber festival. My lady at my yarn shop said that she would also... Uh, donate a prize as well so there'll be some prizes for that I think there I'm gonna give several small prizes just to spread it around a little bit more with the share of the warmth uh, make along there's probably just gonna be one prize uh, out of the finished objects thread so those are my two make alongs a couple of my friends who are other podcasters also have make alongs going on uh, the first one is a historian knits has a make along going through the end of the year for the A Historian Knits podcast here on YouTube, where if you make any of her sock patterns, she currently has two sock patterns published, and she's getting ready to publish two more, and I believe she said they were going to be free patterns. So she's getting ready to post two more, publish two more patterns, so you can make any of her sock patterns to enter in the drawing for the prize uh, there, and that is through the end of the year. Then, um, also, we have uh, A Crocheting Hoovian and... Army Wife Knit Life have a, done a joint giveaway, and I believe you can post on each one of theirs. You have to be a subscriber to both of their podcasts to win, but it's a striping make-along. It doesn't have to be self-striping yarn. It just has to be something with stripes. It can be weaving. I believe Jessica said on Army Wife Knitting Life she would take weaving, crocheting, knitting, um, so anything that's striped, you can go to listen to their podcast. They did a joint podcast um, a couple of weeks ago where they announced this make-along. You can go there and also go to their Ravelry groups and find out more. Um, also, um, Ninja Chickens is having a knit-along for her pair of Cirrus socks that runs till the winter solstice uh, where you can knit her new sock pattern. It's a colorwork sock pattern. I'm going to try to start it here if I can get these other socks finished. I'm going to try to start it and enter that make-along. Plus, she is doing a 40th subscriber giveaway that I'm going to talk about during works in progress. Or no, actually during finished objects. Uh, so you can find out how to get in on. You have to make something to enter in the subscriber giveaway. So, or the 40th episode giveaway, excuse me. So um, we'll get on to that when we get to uh, finished objects. So that's a few of the different make-alongs that I'm aware that are going on. So I hope y'all check those people out. Um, and we're going to go ahead then and move on to finished objects. Okay, I have one finished object that's kind of small, but it's very important, and I have two sort of quasi-finished objects. The object that I have that's finished is a 5x5 five five square that I'm going to donate to the Sister Survivor Blanket Project. Uh, Ninja Chickens is having a 40th episode giveaway, and a th the Thistle Hollow is making 
the sister survivor blanket that is going to be donated to Rachel, who I believe is the first person that spoke out against Larry Nasser, who was the former coach of Team USA Gymnastics, who was who is now serving prison time for sexual abuse of several of the young uh, people that were members of the gymnastics team. Uh, there were 156 people involved in that, women involved in that case, and so uh, Evelyn from th the Thistle Hollow is trying to gather up 156 squares, so Maria is trying to help her gather squares. They need to be five by five. They need to be made of super wash yarn. Okay, and other than that, the design you use, so I just knitted like a simple bias square like you would for a washcloth. I've gotten this one done. I'm going to go ahead and mail this one just in case. I don't want to feel like I haven't followed through, so I do have this. I've got to weave in my ends, but I do have this one done to donate to the Sister Survivor Blanket Project. If you go to Ninja Chicken's channel and you listen to her 40th episode uh, thread on her channel, um, you can find out more about the blanket or you can follow either her or the Thistle Hollow on Instagram and find out more as well. So I'm going to get the ends woven in on this and I'm going to get this in the mail so that that can be donated to the blanket project. Um, this is just um, Red Heart Heart and Soul yarn and um, I'm going to try to get another one done. I made one but it looked kind of wonky so I'm using a fabulous paper clip program. <laughs> Keeper here to keep track of which side I was doing the increases on so and the decreases so it would be nice So I'm gonna try to make at least one more, but I want to go ahead and get this one in the mail um, So that I don't if something happens and I'm not able to finish those other ones um, This is in my silver shed USA purple foxes bag, which I think is really beautiful. I love this fabric Beautiful lined bag with interfacing so it will stand up on its own, which is very nice. So that is my one finished object. Now my two quasi-finished objects are I'm doing the Marine Life uh, Crochet Along Blanket or Blanket Crochet Along, I should say, by uh, Two Hearts Crochet. She is also the one who did the solar system blanket that I made back earlier in the year. And um, I just I saw where she was coming out with this Marine Life uh, blanket. I was incorrect when I spoke last time. I, I, it has 12 blocks, not nine, and we are on week number four. We just got pattern number four. I'm got two blocks finished, so this is my first uh, finished object, or quasi-finished object. I finished the first block, which is the starfishes. Starfishes? Starfish? Starfish. I'm a physicist, not an English major, obviously. So here is my starfish. I made a little mistake right there, but if I hadn't pointed that out, probably nobody would notice that but me. This is corner-to-corner -corner crochet, which is a technique I have never used before. And Laura from a crocheting hoovian gave me some good tips about how I can't carry the yarn. I really do have to cut it. So these are going to have a lot of ends to weave in. But one evening, I'll just sit down with a movie and weave in ends, I think. So there's my first block. Uh, the second block that we had was the blue whales block. So there is a mama and a baby blue whale, and this one has a lot of ends on the back to weave in, but, but uh, a mama and a baby blue whale. And I'm just using acrylic yarn on these because I need to be able to wash them because <laughs> there is already, this one has already been indoctrinated with pet hair uh, because people like to lay on my stuff as I'm working on it. So those are my two finished objects. I will point out, I did not make this beautiful shawl that I have on. My friend Carol made this for me for my birthday. Um, this was a birthday gift from her and it's some beautiful variegated yarn that she found and made me a, a really pretty shawl for my birthday and I'm probably going to take it off because I'm really hot uh, but anyway I wanted to wear it for a little while okay so uh, we're gonna go on now to works in progress okay y'all I've actually jumped up and worked on quite a few things this week uh, that I had been leaving sitting for quite some time so I'm really happy about that the first thing is I have a little problem and this is a finished object technically that I can't wear it in its current state I made this hat Willie oh he found a piece of a gourd <laughs> Anyway, I made this hat back in the spring when Resonance was doing her knit along for the She Rises hat. And I made it out of this beautiful Leon Alexander yarn. And I thought I cast on the right size. And this sucker is too big. Okay, it's too big. Uh, and I can't even wear it as a slouchy hat because I can't stand it being this loose. 
So I'm trying to figure out, and I want to be able to wear it, especially now, because this is the She Rises hat, and it's supposed to be women's fists raised in power, okay? Which I really like that idea right now, because Lord knows we need to stand up for ourselves. Um, I would like to um, fix this. So I'm trying to decide what I'm going to do. I mean, I have some options. I could always run some kind of a, some kind of a, yarn through it, I guess, and tighten it up, okay? I don't particularly want to wash and dry the snot out of it. Uh, I guess I could put some elastic on it, maybe? I don't know. What do y'all think I need to do to fix this? I love the color of it, and I love the hat, and it's got a ponytail hole in it, but see, I can't have that. I can't have that. So I gotta do something about this hat, okay? Who was that one on Fat Albert Mushmelon that always wore his hat down like this? That's how I feel right now. Okay, so anyway, I gotta fix this hat. So if y'all got any ideas, but I love the pattern. The design on it is really super cool. It's got those flower shapes or women's fists or whatever you call it, and the decreases on the crown are really cool looking. They kind of spiral in. I love the yarn. It's Leon Alexander Yarns, and it's called Against the Current. Okay, so I love the yarn, but I can't have that. I don't know if I should have knitted that on smaller needles. I don't know what I did wrong. I didn't know, don't know, but I got to fix it because I want to be able to wear it. So I'm thinking I'm going to run a piece of elastic around the inside of it and kind of gather it up. I kind of hate, that that's kind of my last resort. I may try to run a yarn or something and tighten it up that way because I can't have it this loose. That's too loose. If it was more like that, that would be good. Anyway, so that's my current problem. If you've got any suggestions, feel free to post them in the comments or message me on Ravelry or whatever. So, um, yeah. And the top, now the top has openings in it. I need to actually put some ribbon or something in the top to tighten it up. So I guess I could run some ribbon around in the brim and tighten it up that way. I don't know. Got to do something, though, because I can't wear it like it is. All right. So then the next thing that I'm working on is the next block on that... Uh, Marine Life Knit Along. It's in my Fat Bottom Bags, Kitty Cat's Moods bag that I got at my local yarn shop. Knit two together. Uh, this week's pattern is a crab. Okay. I'm not quite halfway through with it. Uh, I've been enjoying being in the um, virtual knit night group that A Crocheting Whovian runs. If you listen to her podcast, you know about that. Um, but anyway, so here is my, let's see, which way does he go? He goes like this, okay? Here is my crab, all right? He's half done. So there's his little legs, and he's, I'm starting his little claw up here. All right, so um, I'm going to try to finish that up this weekend and get that knocked out because I need to start the sea turtle block, which just came out yesterday. Uh, the pattern comes out every Friday, so the sea turtle came out yesterday and get that done. So that is my next installment of my block for my Marine Life Knit Along. Okay, then um, the next thing that I'm working on, I picked back up my Couch and Cracker socks, okay? Um, they are in my Tesla Knits periodic table bag, Jasmine from Tesla Knits, and she is, was kind enough to donate to my last knit along. You may have seen her beautiful bags that she donated. She makes great drawstring sock size bags. Um, and, with, and I like them because they have a locking feature on them. I am knitting these socks out of Craftsy. This is Craftsy um, Cloudborn Fingering. And this is a colorway called Josh's Cat. And I don't really know why this yarn is... Oh, I got tangled up. That's why I had to cut it. All right. These are the Couch and Cracker Socks by Julia from the Happy Knitting Podcast. She's out of Germany. Uh, these are her, is this her first sock pattern. They've got a little knit pearl texture on them that supposedly looks like crackers, okay? So I am knitting these on my Chowgoo, uh, Chowgoo size one, Chowgoo red lace size one needles. And I had frogged these because I was knitting them too loosely and now I have come back and they look a whole heck of a lot better than they did. So I have just finished my toe increases and I'm getting ready to start the patterning. So, um... Yeah, so I'm going to try to get these get these worked on some, too, and get them out of the way because I really want to make those cirrus socks uh, by Ninja Chickens. So, got that. Did get as far as getting the toe increases done on those after I had frogged them. So, that is definitely progress because I was mad at them and I wasn't going to work on them anymore. Okay. 
Uh, the next thing that I worked on was a hat because Yolanda, that's who I, I did forget to mention this in the make-alongs, Yolanda from the Happy Knits podcast, her and her son, um, are they podcast out of Dallas, Texas. She is actually going to be at East Texas Fiber Festival, I believe, so I hopefully we'll get to meet up with her. She is doing a knit along for hats until October the 15th. Now, I don't know if I'm going to get this done by the 15th, but this is the Sheep Love hat. Okay, this is the Sheep Love hat, and I thought that would be a good introductory color work hat. And it's just in a little store-bought bag that I have here. So I have actually finished my brim, and I've done the setup row now for the color work. So I need to wind my gray yarn so that I can start the color work on the sheep. So, um, yeah, so I'm just up to needing to wind yarn for that now. And I guess I might as well go ahead and wind the white yarn while I'm at it, huh? So I'll have both of them ready so I can actually make some serious progress on that. So, and I know hats don't take very long, but I had started this and then I just kind of sat it to the side and it just got kept getting pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. So time to get back on that. Now, this is a um, mystery knit along that I'm doing. It's called the In the Rough Mystery Knit Along. So if you are participating in the In the Rough mystery knit along you might want to look away because i am going to show how far i am on that okay so this is by michelle steve this is the in the rough mcal okay and we're on clue two clue three comes out on friday so i've got to get to work on finishing clue two i'm about halfway through chart four uh, which is the longest one it has 21 rows on it and then Chart five only has a little 12 rows, yeah, and then chart six has eight rows. So, of course, they're getting longer too. But, um, so if you're not wanting to see, then you need to look away because I'm going to show where I'm at on this. So, uh, this is where I'm at. All right. I am about halfway through. There's a real pretty diamond texture involved here, like diamond in the rough, and so it's a repetitive diamond texture. I made a mistake over here, but guess what? You can't see it. You can only see it if you look real close, and I just won't let people get that close when I'm wearing it. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, I am making this out of... Um, the purple is Blackberry by Primrose Yarn Company on their Sophia base. And then the uh, variegated, it's got browns and grays and a little bit of purple in it. That is Expression Fiber Arts Snow Leopard. And that's their Mulberry Silk uh, Merino blend. And this is uh, Sophia, so it's MCN from Primrose. Okay, so uh, yeah, I am enjoying this knit very much so far. Although it is a chart, she does have the directions written out too so that you can practice uh, reading charts and I lost my little yarn ball off my um, progress keeper there somewhere so I'm sad about that but oh well say la vie uh, but anyway so um, but it is very easy to memorize because it's the same pattern for the each row repeated over and over and then you go to the next row so it's not so bad I'm actually able to keep up but it is a beaded shawl so the beading is coming up I know so um just waiting for that, so I'm probably, I'm going to try to work on that tonight some. Now, last but not least is a project that has lain dormant pretty much ever since I have been podcasting, and I decided to pick it back up uh, many years ago when the person that I was with at the time, and I went to, we would go to Scotland to visit his family, and when I first started knitting, I had big ambitions. I was going to really, 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 really knit, and I was going to make sweaters, and I was going to all this stuff, and I loved the, of course, when you go to Scotland, everywhere you look, you can buy those beautiful fisherman's knit cabled sweaters, and I'm like, I want to make one of those. <laughs> Boy, that was way outside my pay grade at that time, but I bought the stuff. I bought this pattern. It's a Sirdar, Sirdar pattern. Okay, I bought this pattern, and I bought some yarn that came in a ball bigger than my head to make the pattern. And I thought, you know, this is sat because the last, we went to Scotland 16 years ago the last time. Or I went to Scotland the last time 16 years ago with him. And this has been sitting, waiting. So I decided last year that this year I was going to make this sweater. And I started it. I think I started it when the Yarniac started their self-indulgent make-along. And I did the ribbing. And that's as far as I got. 
Well, I've picked it back up and now I'm through the first repeat. This is the back, it's knit in pieces and then seamed together. So I have made it through the first repeat of those diamonds on the bottom, okay? So, um, yeah, I've made it through the first repeat and started on the second. And I'm just gonna try to put a few rows on it every three or four days and before you know it, I'll be done with it. It's kind of my philosophy. So I'm working on the back, but the, or the front, but the patterning, I believe, is exactly the same on the back. It's got these diamonds on the bottom, and then there's these three cable features, and then the, the sleeves have the cable detail going down them also. Um, so, yeah, so we'll see. We'll see. Um, but anyway, that's just knit out of, I don't even still have a yarn tag, I don't think, in here, but it is just a yarn that was it's a uh, wool uh, acrylic blend yarn like the, it's a commercial yarn that you can buy and when I say the ball is bigger than my head and you'll notice I had it in the drawer for so long that the drawer rubbed it and there's a lot of broken pieces on here now as you get down deeper into it it's not that way so this is just where the friction from the drawer um, tore it up so I'm gonna fix that and that is in a bag <laughs> that I got uh, when we went to the Gifted and Talented uh, workshop. It is actually a, a an insulated bag. <laughs> Why I put it in here, I don't know. But it, I love that. That is the logo for the state, state Science and Math School. It says, let's do some science, y'all. Okay, so that is all of my works in progress for this week. So let's come back and talk a little bit about future crafting. Okay, in future crafting, I'm just going to show a couple of patterns that I have gotten. Um, and then one of them goes with a kit that I will show in, in, in acquisitions. So this is the Cirrus sock pattern by Maria from Ninja Chickens. So there's the beautiful color work socks that I want to try to make. Uh, I'm trying to decide what kind of yarn that I should use on those. I've been talking with... Um, Jessica from Army Wife Knitting Life, and she had some suggestions, so I'm going to check those out. Then I also have been following Irene Strange on um, Instagram, and I've been watching the different amigurumi patterns that she makes, and she was working on one that really caught my attention, and it was Muffin the Puffin. <laughs> Muffin the Puffin! Yay! Muffin the Puffin, and so I bought that the day that it came out, and I can't wait to make Muffin the Puffin. I think that's just adorable. Um, Ellie Mae wants out, so let me go let her out. Okay, now Ellie Mae's happy because she was, she was wanting out. <laughs> that was a 100-pound red bone coonhound that was serenading us there. Now, um, the young man who, he's not, a, I used to call him a boy, but he's my neighbor's son, and he is definitely not a boy anymore. He's a grown man, getting ready to be a father himself, but he has always helped me with my cattle. When I have to take cattle, which I just took some cattle uh, to the processor this week, some beef to the processor this week, uh, he always helps me load them. Well, he is expecting his first child. It's going to be a little boy, and it's he's going to be born in December. Well, his mother, who the the mother of the man that helps me, who is my age now, she uh, asked me if I could make something for the little boy, and I was planning on making him a baby blanket anyway, but she said, can you make this? <laughs> I'm sure y'all have seen this. They want me to make one of these for their grandson. So I'm like, yeah, I can make that. So um, anyway, I'm going to make them a bobble beard beanie hat. <laughs> okay, because both, because this, the young man who's fixing to have the ba family, who's fixing to be the dad for the first time, he has a beard. So I guess they wanted the little boy to have a beard too. So anyway, so there's that. I'm going to try to make that. That should make up really, really quick. So, um... I'm probably going to try to put that together this weekend. So, anyway, uh, yeah, so that is a paid-for pattern by Grandma Beans, if you want to make one, too. And it comes up into adult sizes, if you want to make yourself one. So, um, then last but not least, I actually bought this kit uh, from Lion Brand. But you can also get the, I believe you can also get the pattern just separately uh, from her Ravelry group. It's by uh, One Dog Wolf, Chi Wei of One Dog Wolf. And it is Baby Penguin Amigurumi pattern. I had been watching her make this. And Lion Brand had a sale to help get ready, kind of kickstart your holiday crafting. 
So um, I bought the kit. So this is the pattern that the kit comes that comes with the kit. Uh, and so those are some things that I want to try to make up here in the short term um, for um, for fun. <laughs> So, and you know, I'm already thinking about next year's fair. So you got to always have, plan ahead, right? So now let's come back. So that's all. Well, let me just say this. That's all my crafty content. Um, I'm going to talk about a few acquisitions. Some of them are crafty related uh, and some of them are not. And then we're going to move on and talk about science and talk about farm life. So uh, if all you're here for is the craftiness, I'm glad you came and hopefully you'll come back. And if not, we're going to move on and talk about acquisitions. Okay, on acquisitions this week, I have a few crafty ones, so let me show you uh, those first. I bought, I'm doing a few holiday-related swaps uh, this time, and so I was kind of looking for some yarns, and I found uh, Daughter of Halloween was having a D-stash, and she had posted about it on Instagram. So um, I kind of looked through the D-stash yarn and found a couple of good deals, and so I got this skein. It's by Prairie Dye Studio, and this is their Anna Sock, which is 80-20. It's 80% merino, 20% nylon, okay? And um, my intention is to donate or to give this to my swap, one of my swap partners. But then again, when I saw it, I'm kind of like, I sure think it's pretty. It's called Tropical Fish, okay? Isn't that beautiful? It's got blues and greens, and I sure, I kind of have fallen in love with it, so I don't know. Or I might donate it as a prize. I don't know. It's going to be kind of hard for me to part with. But that was my first acquisition. Uh, then, Miss Betsy and I went to Little Rock uh, last weekend in the midst of all the rain that we had. A friend of mine gave me a sink. She had an antique cast iron sink that had just been re-enameled. And uh, my sink fell apart. <laughs> the trap has rusted through. And so my sink fell apart. And I was like, okay, well, it's time to put in a new sink anyway. So um, my neighbor is going to help me with that. And I've got all the, another friend donated me a bag of parts because they had some extras. And then I got a free sink. All I had to do was go pick it up. So I went to visit Darsha. And she also gave me a lot of goodies, which I haven't fully gone through yet. Because um, she is about to get married for the first time at age 60. So she is having to um, make some room. <laughs> I couldn't imagine trying to make room in my house for another person. It would just be horrible to try to do, and I, so I'm just not going to. But she is willing to do that, so um, she gave me some other things. But when we went there, I said, well, let's run to buy um, one of the craft stores. There's a cra we, you know, The town that I work in has both a Hobby Lobby and a Michaels, and I haven't been to the Michaels yet. So I said, let's go there. And I picked up these really cute sets of charms, and I'm going to make some progress keepers out of them. I got the little paws because I thought Willie would appreciate having those represent him. And then I got the little owls over here. And I thought those would be really cute to make some little progress keepers out of. Uh, and then I also got this set of yarn keys. I have seen these where you can put your tag. You can run this through um, a strand of the yarn and then you can stick the information tag in there. And it's a way to keep track of um, your yarn label. Okay. So, the yarn keys, I think they're, these are, I used my 40% uh, off coupon on those, so, so they were not on sale, so I got those. Uh, then, as I said, I got the kit from Lion Brand to make the little penguin, and so what comes in the kit is, there's multiple skeins of all of these, but I'll just show each one. You've got the black and white for his face and then his little scarf is red and then his little body because he's a baby penguin is made out of this um, Bussel I don't know how you say that Bussel <laughs> I don't know anyway it's made out of this stuff this fuzzy yarn looks like you stripped up your towel your terry towels but anyway, so, um, yeah, so this is what comes in. The, you get two skeins of all of these except, I guess, the white because you don't need as much white for his little face. Um, so that's the kit, and I think the kit and the pattern, and it, it's enough to make two. You can make two baby penguins with this kit. So um, I think that the kit itself, when it was on sale, was under $12, 
course, was shipping that got it up to like 14 something. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, so there's that. And then last but not least, um, Natel Draw Stuff, who is one of my favorite pen makers, is actually going to be relocating to London, England, which, I mean, that's wonderful for her, but it makes me sad because now she won't be domestic shipping anymore, but I don't care because I like her pens. Well, she was what she did was for customers who had spent so much money with her, you got a code or you got a discount. Um, and so you could purchase, she had a shop update where you could purchase uh, pens and then she would send you um, some, some bonus pens in your order, okay? So, um, she, I got my order, I made my order, and the pens that I ordered, now this is a joint pen that she did with Clever Clove, and it says, we rise by lifting others. It's got a little, um, a little, um, raccoon and squirrel there you can't tell much about it i guess it's not it's too far away to focus on it let me see if i can get that to focus better it's probably too i'm probably holding it too close anyway so there you go we rise by lifting others i wanted one of those and then i also ordered um these are both uh combos with her and oh plesiosaur and they're endangered species pins. It's the slow loris and the baby black rhino. And I saw a video the other day on Facebook of some slow loris that were being released into the wild or being released after they had been injured or something. And their little faces just got to me. They just have the sweetest, most little sincere faces ever. Uh, but I want to talk about in farming about something else that had a sweet face that wasn't sweet at all. But we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> but then, what surprised me was like, my package is awfully thick for just three pins plus one bonus pin. She actually sent me four bonus pins. And these are all seconds, but she sent me um, these two whales. Now, I don't know what those are exactly. I'm going to need to look them up. But these are called her creature feature pins. Okay. Two, two whales. And then, um, this is another one of the endangered species pins in with, um, Oplesiosaur, and I believe that's some kind of a chameleon. Then, I don't, this is some kind of a, a arthropod that lives in the ocean, but I don't know what it is. But he's kind of neat looking. And then, I actually have one of these pins already because I loved it so much. I ordered, um... The one I ordered was in the gold, so this is the silver colorway of her polar bear pen. So I was really tickled to get that also. So um, I believe that she's going to be shutting her shop down this month in preparation for the move. She's doing a liquidation of her shop as much as possible, and then in preparation for the move is going to be shutting down. So if you want to get some of her stuff, you better get after it. So, um, those are my acquisitions for um, this week. So, now we're going to move on and talk about science a little bit. Okay, I have a couple of different things I want to talk about this week on uh, science topics. The first one is kind of pertaining to our crafting. It certainly pertains to anyone who works with color. Um, there's really two types of color, and we're talking about this actually in my um, physics majors class right now. We're talking about the eye and how we perceive color. And in our eye, in the human eye, there are three color receptors. They're called cones. And they work off of bright light vision, and they're basically straight back from your pupil inside your eye. Um, they need they need a, a minimum. There's a certain amount of light that they need to be activated. That's why in the dim light you don't see color very well. Uh, but there's two types of color. The eye, the light color is called additive color because there you're adding colors together to create white light. Whereas with pigment. Um, you have what's called subtractive color, where if you mix colors together, you subtract out colors, and you end up, if you were to mix all the colors together, ideally you would get black. So, a student of mine did a talk about, and I'm just going to try to show this on the screen here, if I can, about, that's not going to work, let me do this. 
student of mine did a talk in class the other day about, about how we see color, okay? Now, we all know a little bit uh, probably about complementary colors, and actually the class that I'm taking at East Texas Fiber Festival from Logan is not a dyeing class. It's about color theory, and so I'm sure he'll touch on this. So he's going to talk probably more about pigment color, which are the subtractive colors. See how they all add up to make, um, to make the... Um, dark okay but the color that we're talking about is light so that's additive color and they all add up to make white now one thing that you'll notice is this student was talking about what are called forbidden colors colors that our brain literally can't process because our color cones are red excuse me red green and blue okay and so you put a red and a green cone together, depending on how much you activate of each one. If it's a 50-50 activation, you get yellow. And if you have a 50-50 activation of green and blue, you get cyan. And if you have a 50-50 um, activation of red and blue, you get magenta. Okay? So um, these colors, then, like if, we, if we're looking at a color that is mi red mixed with green, Green, we'll see a variation of yellow. Sometimes it's a little more green. Sometimes it's a little more reddish. If we're looking at a, ver a color mix with blue and uh, green, we get this variation of this turquoise color, the cyan. And then with red and blue, you get this variation of purple. And depending on which you have, which cone is activated more, it'll either shift it toward blue or shift it toward red. But here's the thing. If you try to look at pigments where you're mixing yellow and blue you actually your brain has no capacity to process yellow blue it has no signal that tells it what yellow blue is supposed to look like so the idea behind these forbidden colors is your brain literally gets confused and doesn't know what to do with that information so what my student had done is he had found a video that had an image in it Okay, um, and the video showed an image of blue and yellow together, okay? So you have a blue and yellow, and this is on a video that I'll link before, down below, and you can pause the video to see this. But the idea is you sort of fool your brain where you stare at these two plus signs, and then you literally, it's kind of like looking at one of those 3D pictures or those hidden pictures that we used to have that were all the dots and you had to kind of relax your eye. You either need to look at it where you're trying to look past it so you're like relaxing your eye and blurring your near vision, or you need to try to, to cross your eyes to bring these two, these two plus signs together. What will happen when you do that is your brain is going to get confused. And what I noticed when I did that is when these two come together, there's a flash of this weird color for an instant. And then it kind of flips back and forth to flashing blue and yellow, blue and yellow, blue and yellow. Because my brain doesn't know what to do with that color. It doesn't have any information to process that uh, color. Willie just knocked the box over. So, uh, anyway, so forbidden colors means that our brain literally doesn't know what to do with that information. And I thought, well, that's really cool because that's something that we as as crafty people can appreciate when we when we work with color. I was really impressed by that talk. So I'm going to link the video down below that he uh, referenced in that talk, and then. Um, you can try it out. I'm going to turn this off for just a second and fix my little catastrophe. Okay, so another thing that I did that's pertaining to science this week is uh, there was a really cool event last week, actually, uh, since I didn't record last week, uh, up in, in Russellville at the National Forest Service Regional Office called Go Native, Grow Native. Or grow native, go native. I can't remember, uh, but it was about a native. It was about native plants, and it's a really, really cool uh, place where you can go and get tons of information and seeds, uh, free seeds for native plants. And so uh, Miss Betsy and I went up there to get cool stuff because she likes to pick up stuff for her grandkids since her daughter is actually kind of getting a jump start on um, schooling the kids because they're all too young to go to public school, but she's already kind of homeschooling her kids. So she likes to pick up free information and I wanted some free seeds. So um, 
we went and there was different agencies. There was the state park system was there. The Arkansas Forestry Commission. The Arkansas Archaeological Survey was there. Uh, Pine Ridge Gardens was there. And I got one of their new catalogs. And I'm so excited because she's the lady that's just over in London uh, that sells tons and tons of native plants. And she's where I've gotten a lot of my native, native plants from. Um, and then there were just a, and the Quails Unlimited or Quails for Arkansas or something was there and um, Arkansas Game and Fish Commission, just different state agencies and different agencies where they're giving away free information. Uh, and they were very, very generous with their stuff. So uh, Arkansas Master Naturalist was there also too. So I'm gonna show you a few of the things, a few of the things that I picked up and then I'm gonna talk to you about how to make seed bombs. Uh, so of course, you know, you gotta have your tags and these are sponsored by the leave no trace organization and i love this one it says leave no trace bigfoot's been doing it for years <laughs> uh and here's a little booklet that i got with them from the leave no trace good called bigfoot's playbook that shows how to um different activities to do with different ages of kids like trash trash timeline about how long it takes for stuff to decay um, and then, uh, out of sight, out of mind, stuff like that. So it's different activities and they're broken up by age group, uh, like campfire, campfire impact and all that stuff. So this is a really cool activity book that I got and these other tags. And then, um, my friend Ellen, who I take basket class with is, hold on, I dropped my cool tag. Oh, sorry, Willie. Ugh. Um, I went inside and filled out one of their customer satisfaction surveys. So I got a cool Smokey the Bear luggage tag. And of course, I'm not going to put this on any luggage. I'm not going to put this on luggage that's going to get lost at the airport. I'm going to keep that sucker somewhere safe. Probably put it on my um, outdoorsy Christmas tree. Then there was a group there, and I don't remember which group it was, but they had a table of, of plaster cast of different tracks and then they had different cast of animal scats so scats that you wanted to identify and they gave away these keychain identifier cards for animal scat so if you're out in the woods and you see some poop you can figure out what it is <laughs> isn't that cool so you can carry that in your in your uh, hiking bag and you can identify what animal that was that was there. So I thought that was really cool. And then on the back, it has information about, about what's in it and what, what might be in it that they've eaten and stuff like that. Um, okay. So then, uh, of course, there were different groups there that had um, information about plants because it was a plant event. So I was able to pick this up from the State Plant Board. This is invasive insects, plants, and pathogens of concern in Arkansas. So um, it's got all of it's got really great pictures in it of different pests and different diseases on trees and things like that that you can use to identify invasive species. And I like that not only because of my interest in invasive species, sometimes I'm asked to teach about them as a master naturalist. Um, also, tons of free seeds. Tons and tons of free seeds. There was a group there that was about restoring native grasses. So these are all native grass seeds that I picked up. And I'm actually going to plant these, I think, uh, in an area. I'm going to till up an area in my garden that I want to turn into an orchard anyway. And I'm going to plant these grass seeds in that area. Um, so it's Alamo switchgrass. Um, little stem, blue stem, Cimarron little blue stem, Caw big blue stem, and Cheyenne, um, Cheyenne Indian grass. So these are all pr native prairie grasses that used to grow here in Arkansas that were replaced by pasture grasses. But there's a program where you can plant these native grasses in your pastures that the Game and Fish will help you with. Um, I was talking with some people from Quails Unlimited because um, I'm actually, as I've mentioned a few times, very happily starting to see more quails on our property. We used to have a lot of quails when I was younger and actually the group was called Save the Quails and they will send out a biologist and they're working in conjunction with the Game and Fish Commission. Um, so quailwise.com and then savethequails.com. Um, they'll bring a wildlife biologist out to your property for free to evaluate your property 
uh, and tell you how to, you can get more wildlife. I want to I want to join, as I'd mentioned in the past, rejoin the Acres for Wildlife program because I want my pro my property to be a haven for wildlife and not just a farm. I think that's important. And then, of course, because it was the Forestry Commission. Oops. Then, of course, because it was the Forestry Commission. Oh, let me, then, of course, because it was the Forestry Commission. Um, there was a lot of stuff about Smoky Bear, but they were also there was a group there giving away from the Forestry Service purple coneflower seeds. So I picked up. Those are my favorite wildflowers. So I picked up several bags of those. Um, probably more than I should have, but oh well. <laughs> Um, and then um, the beekeeping store was there, and the Pollinator Partnership had given them some um, booklets on our native bee species. So we have all different kinds of native bee species here in the south, and so you need to see what kind of plants you could plant to help those out, because no pollinators, no food. And so we need to take care of our bees. We need to not try to kill them every time we see them. Because most bees are not going to try to sting you. Now, Africanized honeybees are a whole other thing. But um, my honeybees or bumblebees or stuff, they don't want to sting you because then they die. So I try to not kill them if I can help it. You know, I, I have accidentally killed some and I felt really bad. But, uh, but anyway, so there's all kinds of information in there about the bees in this little booklet that I got from them. And then, as I said, of course, because it was the... Um, if it, because it was the Forestry Commission, of course, there was tons of stuff about Smoky Bear. So I got the little booklet, the little cartoon uh, comic book about the origin of Smoky the Bear. You know, there he is in the little fire and he was all scared. And then, of course, they had bookmarks and stuff like that. So I picked up that stuff and, you know, erasers and pencil sharpener. You know, I'm a nerd. I like stuff like that. Uh, then some other cool things that I got. And this is um, actually a book that I'm going to use in the project we're doing with Atkins. This was by the Arkansas Archaeological Survey and we have a survey station not very far from us. And this is um, about the foodways of our region. So about the Native American foodways and what kind of things they would plant. And there's tons of activities in here for kids to do. It's basically a textbook that they've written for sort of middle school grades, which is perfect because that's the grade range that we're doing with the Gifted and Talented project. Um, so, let's see, I think that was pretty much all the stuff that I was going to show that I picked up. Oh, uh, we got some other, there were some other uh, pollinator uh, seed packages here, so I, I picked up a lot of seeds. There were, I mean, and they were very generous people. They, they had a lot of cool stuff there. But what I was going to share with you was, um, oh, and here's the Smoky Bear story. Here's a nicer, a nicer version. This was from the visitor center. We went into the visitor center and picked up a bunch of booklets. So, <laughs> I can't help it. I love that stuff. Was how to make seed bombs. There were different groups there that were making uh, seed, they call them seed balls or seed bombs, whatever you want to call them. Uh, one group was letting you make your own where you could pick out the flowers that you wanted to uh, have in it. And then the other group were making them. And this was the Fish uh, Federal Wildlife Service had a table there and they were giving out seed balls that were made with purple comb flower. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when I went to the table, there was another table there that, where you could make your own and you got to pick out the seeds that you wanted to put in it. So I put yellow coneflower in it, uh, the Ozark yellow coneflower, which is native to this area, but it is somewhat endangered. So I decided I would use that. But um, making seed balls is actually fairly simple and this is a great activity to do with kids. You get yourself some seeds and you can order free seeds from places. Um, or you can go to an event like this and pick up seeds. And then all you need is some potter's clay, some um, humus compost, some water, and some patience. Uh, so what you do is you mix the clay and the humus compost together, and then you make a little opening, and you fill the seeds in, and then you pinch it closed. Now here's the key. You have to let it dry. So you need to sit these out on a cookie sheet and let them all dry out, and then you can go out. Looks like a little piece of poop, I know, but it's not. It's a seed ball, trust me. Um, you can go out and put these out in your garden, or some people like to be gardenistas and find like abandoned vacant lots and just throw them out, you know, as they're walking by or driving by, and seed bomb places, I guess. Probably Need to probably not do do a lot of that, but if it's native plants, I guess it might be all right. Okay, 
So um, I got three seed bombs that I'm going to put out around my property. This is the one that I made with the yellow cone flowers, and then these other ones have the purple cone flowers. But it was a really, really cool event, and it was totally free. Of course, a lot of it was geared toward kids, but it was also geared toward adults. I mean, Miss Marianne King was there with her, like I said, with um, Pine Ridge Gardens, and I got a copy of her new catalog for next year, so I can't wait to sit down with that and my Starks Brothers catalog and circle all the things I would love to plant. So, native plants matter, y'all. Native plants matter. Check them out. So now uh, we're going to move on and talk about uh, farm life. I forgot to mention a couple of things in the science segment that had more to do with my job as a professor. Um, I am actually going to be a minority mentor. I was on the minority mentoring program because I'm a woman. I'm obviously not a racial or ethnic minority here in Arkansas, but I am a woman. And so I was approached and asked to be a minority mentor. And I said, sure. So I've actually been assigned a, men a mentee. Is that the right word? Uh, who I'm going to meet on Tuesday. There's an event uh, that all the mentors are going to go to and we're going to be at on Tuesday and I will get to meet. And so, um, I'm excited about that. But something that's going to tie into my final thoughts segment is we have been talking in our class about scientific communication. And there's a really cool article by Alan Alda, um, you know, formerly of MASH. And he has the Alan Alda Institute. And he's a big proponent of science communication and science education. And he was talking about how we can be more effective communicators by being more empathetic and trying to understand... Um, people and so it led to an interesting discussion about the black lives matter and the blue lives matter and some of the different things that are going on in the world right now where people are doing things that are very provocative to other groups and um you know my students were were uh talking about this and i said well i'm going to share an experience that i had um it was, a, it was nothing major, but it certainly gave me some perspective. I was listening to a program uh, on NPR called StoryCorps, and it's where they go around and they interview, like one person interviews another and they record it. And it's very candid and very personal and very intimate. And in this case, it was a mother and a son. And they had lived in Denver, Colorado area at the time uh, that this incident occurred. And... Um, she, the woman was white and she had adopted an African American baby. And it was a young man that she was, it was her son that she was talking with. And, um, she had said, you know, I never thought about you being different in the eyes of society until an event occurred that involved him interacting with the police. And he was with a white friend and, some things happened, and I'm going to try to find it. I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but he ended up being severely beaten and put into the hospital. And the, and I believe they ended up suing the, the city and, and getting a settlement because the cops, in this case, had had were in the wrong, in this case. And I'm not saying they're, I'm not by any means saying that they're always in the wrong, but in this case, you know, the jury had deemed that, that they had they had wrongly almost killed this young man. Um, and she said, I never thought about what people like Trayvon Martin's family were saying or these, or, or, um, um, different people were, were talking about, I can't call to mind the name of the, the man who was, who was killed in front of his family, but, um, I never thought about warning you about how you behaved in public because of your skin color until that day. She said, I remember walking into the hospital room and starting to scream. And so I told my students, I said, okay. I said, you know, I as a white woman have never had to think about that either. Now, as a woman, I've had to think about certain things, but because I am white, I've never had to think about that. And I said, what I have come to understand is when people do things that are to us seem to be over the top and provocative in order to elicit a response. I have to back up and say, okay, 
They are not doing that just to be a jerk. They are not doing that just to be disrespectful. They feel that the only way that they are going to be heard is to be that bold or to act in that way to provoke or to draw attention. So what do they feel, what has occurred, you know, that has caused them to feel like they've been backed into a corner? Because what my student, one of my students was saying, was saying, you know, we tend to compartmentalize ourselves. Like, I, and he's a young white man. He said, and so I would say, I, as a white man, feel this. And, and I said, okay. And he, and he said, and then what I do is I then diminish other people's responses by saying, you're not in my group because I'm distinguishing myself from a different group than you. And I said, you're exactly right. And I said, but we have to ask ourselves, when people usually come out with that, it's because they have been backed into a corner. Okay? So... The reason, say, for example, the protests in the NFL are happening is because, I, you know, to some degree, those people believe they can't be heard any other way. Now, I understand that, that is a very controversial issue, and there are a lot of people who don't listen once you talk about that. But what I... I told my students, I said, what we have to do is when someone provokes us and we want to get angry and we want to shut down, um, we have to ask ourselves, why do I feel that way? And what has made them feel like they need to go to that degree? I said, that's where the communication breaks down. We just get to the point of I'm offended and then we don't go, what has happened to these people that they need to speak this way? Like the Me Too movement. You know, these women are finally standing up and people are like, well, why did they wait so long? Well, you know, there's a lot of reasons why they waited this long. But now they're speaking and now we need to listen. Even if it bought her, it's scary. Even if it makes us very uncomfortable. Even if it initially offends us. We need to try to move past our being offended and try to reach a place where we can at least understand where they're coming from. You know, and, and I have to remember about that with people that I don't agree with. You know, the people, you know, as I've said many times, I'm a big old liberal snowflake. And I hear people say things and I'm just like, Ugh! and I'm like, okay, but what, wh where are they, what place are they coming from? So I need to try to understand what place they're coming from. And then I still may not agree with them. And I still may say, okay, I don't agree with your point of view. But at least then I have made that step to try to engage them and to have a dialogue. Um, I realize this only applies when people are, are, I mean, there are some people that you can't dialogue with. There are some people who I believe are truly evil. There are some people I believe are truly messed up to the point that I don't want to dialogue with them. I don't want to try to understand them. I don't. But for the majority of people, I think that there needs to be some understanding there. Or at least, at least understand why they're responding that way. Even if I don't agree with them, I need to try to understand them. Um, I guess I said all that to say I had an experience this week at the barn. And on the face of it, I was incredibly hurt. Um... And I don't think the families, any of the barn families listen to this. And I'm not going to say anything derogatory or go into a lot of detail. But um, there were two instances where I didn't have my understanding eyes on. I didn't have my empathy eyes on. Because I was hurt. And so the first instance was a little more... more well, to me, my personal experience in it was a little bit more minor, so I'll talk about it first. Um, there's a young woman, and she's come in, moved in from somewhere else. You know, she's recently moved here. Um, and initially, we didn't have a full understanding of her needs. And so, her mom said, oh, she knows how to ride. She does this, she does this, she does this, she does this. And so we're like, okay, great. Put her on a horse. Let her go. Oh, my goodness. Fell totally apart. Fell totally apart. And, and we would say, you need to pay attention. You need to go this way. And she just would shut down. 
just completely shut down. Well, the mother wasn't tell giving us any information. She was talking to the other mothers, and I finally talked to one of the other mothers and found out, okay, she has sensory processing issues. Okay, so now we know what to do about that. Well, and so we rock on for a while. Well, then um, about three months ago, during the summertime program, she wanted a more challenging ride. Okay, well, we had a horse that was needing to be ridden. Now, not a dangerous horse, but a horse that's just a little bit, she gets a little when she doesn't get ridden a lot. Just doesn't want to work. Well, put, her, put the little girl on her, and this horse will challenge you. She will definitely be a challenge. So the little girl's riding her, and periodically would have a meltdown. You know, Marianne would handle it. Well, Friday, I'm doing dressage with Deborah on Fridays. <laughs> Deborah's dressage days. And so she comes, and they can't do their usual routine. And I said, you just need to get on her. I mean, you just go. Come on. You've been riding her for four months. Get her ready and get on her. Well, little girl never would participate in the group, never would participate in the group. And I was helping the kids. You know, I had gotten there early and ridden, and then I was helping everybody. I was teaching and the little girl was just not around. She was outside. She was in her in the car. She was not where she was supposed to be. I don't know where she was at. So I went outside and found their mom. And I said, Is she okay? And the mom starts to cry. I'm like, what's going on? And she said, the move has been very hard on her because they moved from a bigger town. To a smaller town where she's not one of the locals and that can be very hard when you live in a small town she doesn't fit in the family doesn't really fit in because they're a little bit you know march their own drum kind of like I totally understand that and then she said and this is the first time this has come to light that she has OCD and anxiety disorder okay so changing her routine really upsets her apple cart I'm like, okay, I wish I had known this before now, but, you know. So, what I thought was just her being a pill was stemming from that. And what I thought was the mom just being very, a little bit pushy about the kid sometimes, was just stemming from her trying to get her kid, seeing her kid struggle because she's not making friends at school, because she is different, um, feeling very lonely, very sad, having a very hard time. And then when the, she gets to the barn and it all falls apart there, she just has nothing. So that totally changed my thinking here. And so I went back inside and I said, I, I first asked the mom, I said, well, I have some time. I have about 30 minutes before my next group starts. Do you think she would like for me to work with her? And she said, yes. So I went in and I found her. And she was on her horse, at least. And I said, okay, let's you and me go work together. Just, just the two of us will go work together. Now, the little horse's appeal, and all the horses were leaving the arena, and the horse went running across the arena. It kind of freaked her out real bad and scared her because she's never cantered on this horse. The horse was cantering, and she was riding it beautifully. And, and the little girl was crying. I said, hey. And, both, and me and Miss Marianne both said, hey, you looked fabulous. Did you feel like you were going to fall off? And she said, no, I just got scared. And I said, See, now you know you can ride her canter and you looked great. And I said, here's what you need to do when she starts to do that. And I showed her how to fix it. And we rode around, or she rode around for about 30 minutes. And she did great with her. And she was all smiles at the end. And this child has never said 10 words to me. And she comes up to me as they're getting ready to leave and hugs me. She said, thank you. <laughs> and I started to almost cry. I'm about to cry now. Because, you know, that's what happens when we put our listening ears and our empathy ears and our empathy eyes on. We can actually help. The other situation was a little more hurtful to me. Um, because I have helped this young woman for two years. She's ridden one of my good horses. And her attitude has significantly changed in about the last six to nine months. Now, she's a teenager, so we'll write off a little bit of it to that. And, you know, at the barn, they get a very great program for a very inexpensive price. The, the fees that they are charged really don't even cover the cost of the horses. 
and uh, Miss Marianne and her daughter, her oldest daughter that's a friend of mine, are the one that I knew that I got involved the barn with because of her. And I essentially subsidize everything else. Miss Marianne, of course, does the most of this. Um, so, this week, this young woman is supposed to be helping me um, with Bo. And she hasn't been. And there was some miscommunication, but then this, this mother is very, you can tell she's real agitated, and she comes up to me, and I said, well, we need to talk about schedule, and she said, well, we feel like we're being picked on, we feel like we're being seen out, blah, 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 blah. And she finally said, we shouldn't have to work, we're paying money. And I said, you're only paying X dollars, and it doesn't cover the cost of the horse, much less the lights, or the teaching, or the feed, or any of these things. And, I, and she said, well, we shouldn't have to, blah, 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 and I'm like, we just want to go some, you know, do this. And I said, well, then you're going to need to go somewhere else. And you're not taking my horse. And she just kept on at me. And I was so hurt by this. I was so incredibly hurt that I wasn't good enough. You know, we weren't good enough. We weren't good enough. We weren't good enough. We're not challenging her. We're not meeting her needs. I was really hurt, y'all. I mean, I cried last night. I got on the VKN. I felt so bad for that bunch of people on there because I just went blah, 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 blah to them. And then I got off there and I cried. And I go back to the barn. Well, this was Thursday. I'm sorry. This was Thursday. Well, then Friday we had a lesson and everything seemed to be okay. But the mother would not even speak to me. Wouldn't make eye contact with me. Well, the dad came. And I hadn't seen him in a while. The dad came and picked the little girl up. Um, spoke to him and everything seemed normal with him. But this morning we had practice for obstacle course which they have to do on the ground and it kind of shows where the holes are in their groundwork and you know even if you have a dead broke horse you still need to teach them to load on a trailer and to um do the do the things that you need them to do because you may think it doesn't matter if they don't load on the trailer right away but i'm telling you when you replace when there's a wildfire coming and you've got to get those horses on the trailer and they can smell smoke and they're freaking out they need to trust you enough to walk up on that trailer um, so I was working with this young woman and she was kind of silent and surly and that's fine. And then the mom still didn't say anything to me that morning and I, and I, my feelings were, I mean, I wasn't rude to him. I spoke when I walked through and everything and I talked to Mary and I said, I don't know what's going on, but this is not cool. And then the young woman didn't want to do all the activities. And I went and got her and said, you, you need to do these. I mean, we need to, you need to check this off, you know, make sure you do everything. So she did, but under, under protest. Well, then a bunch of the kids were going to go outside and ride in the big pasture. But we said, you have to put on a saddle. One of the activities that we were doing was riding bareback and she had done that and that was fine. I said, you can't go out there without a saddle on. I don't know. The other horses may start running up the fence that are over in the pasture and the horses could start bucking and it's a little cooler this morning than normal and everything. And you just need to wear a saddle. Well, she made a face and rode off bareback. I said, well, you can't go out there without a saddle. And I, th and I was just broken hearted. I'm just like, she, they're fixing to leave the barn. They don't, you know, they don't, you know, I've helped them for two years and they just think I'm trash and they think my horse, you know, I just, I had given up my horse. And, that, and what really hurt me about all of this is when all this chatting was going on on Thursday, it was the mom. The girl wouldn't even look at me. She would just look down. And I finally got her cornered up and said, you and I need to have a talk. And we kind of talked through some things and everything. Well, after... A few, you know, the other kids went out. You know, Rory was out there on Sterling, and she was doing great with him. It was great. I loved watching this. Um, I look around, and here comes here comes a little girl with the horse and saddle. And I said, "Oh, you're going to join us? Great!" And, and I'm and I'm, so, I'm so glad. And she went out there and had the best time because part of her deal has been she hadn't been wanting to ride with the group. She's been wanting to just do her own thing. So she went out with the group, and I was so excited and tickled. Well. Then later on, the mom, and, and then she helped me with barn chores, and she did anything that I asked, and I'm like, great. Well, the mom comes back later to pick her up, and Miss Marianne and her family are, are riding. They're busy, so it's just me in the barn, and I'm finishing up, and I said, oh, we're almost done. We're just finishing up, and 
the little girl walks past her mom, kind of makes face, and I, and her mom looks at her like she's like, I don't like that. And she said, it's teenager stuff. And she said her dad has been having to work out of town a lot. And she's a daddy's girl. So when did this start? And it turns out that the dad working out of town directly correlated to when the attitude started. And then she has a she has older brothers and she has a younger sister, like a very much younger sister. And the older brothers have always been the center of attention because they played sports. And now the baby sister is starting to eat into the time because we were talking about scheduling. She's like, I'm not sure I can get her here all those days because, you know, I have the other kid and, you know, I can't do everything for Eleanor anymore. I have to think about her. And I looked at Eleanor's face and she just looked down and I thought, okay, here's what's going on. Eleanor's having to scrap and fight for attention and her dad's not around and she's, you know, she's feeling like she doesn't matter. Got it. And I said, okay. I said, tell you what, if you can get her here on the days that I'm here, I'm here Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and sometimes Saturday, um, I can get her home. I'll make sure she has a ride home. And... And I said, also, here's the schedule. This is, you know, there was some miscommunication, and here's the schedule, and this is what we want, and everything. So, I hope, and I talk, and I just got off the phone before I started recording with Miss Marianne. We were talking about this. I said, I hope that this has fixed these problems. And I believe, hopefully, it has helped because I have seen. Sorry, y'all, I'm getting kind of emotional. I have seen the direct impact of what empathy and kindness and caring can do for these kids and these horses. I've seen it with Rory and Sterling. You know, Rory was not interested in riding, and all of a sudden, I started helping her with Sterling. Sterling wasn't being ridden as much, and he, he was just so sad. And those two together are amazing. I'm going to put some videos in here of the kids running up the hill at the end so y'all can see. And um, she's the one that's laughing. Y'all, I've seen what this can do. So, what I told Miss Marianne, I said, we're going we're gonna to roll with this and see what happens. And Marianne was like, I'm so... She was very upset. She thought they were fixing to leave the barn or she was going to have them to ask them to leave. And I hope that... With our now that we're looking with our empathy eyes and listening with our empathy ears and having our hearts open with empathy, that we can um, keep moving forward. So that was a lot. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, but that kind of is seems like has been the theme with the farm. Now the other farm stuff that's going on. <laughs> I probably should have put all that in final thoughts, but that was kind of long. Um, I got turkeys. I got turkeys. Yay, I got turkeys. I got three turkeys. I got uh, a young Jake and a young Jenny or a young hen and then a year old hen. There's the two young ones are Narragansetts and the older one is a Holland White. Um, I chased cows with my car the other day when we were taking uh, steers. It was time to take, you know, it was fall and it was time to take steers to the processor. And we had that really mean one that I was really worried about. Chased him with my car, but we got him in there. Um, then, um, I think I talked about that last time, actually. But anyway, um, no, you don't need those. You don't need those. Um, and then, um, I had a raccoon killing my chickens. My chickens didn't want to go in the coop one night, and I shoot them in there, and two of them got killed. And I feel terrible. I feel just terrible about that because they didn't want to go. They were telling me they were scared. And that morning, the next morning I went out there and I opened the door and the geese and the two surviving chickens and the rooster who was hurt were all clustered up against the door and came pouring out. And I look over and there's a raccoon going up the wall and out through a place where the tin and the roof was loose. Um, so I got a live trap and I caught him. And if you follow my Instagram, you saw my video of him. I caught him, and I took him up to the National Forest and released him. Um, so I took care of that. Got the beef delivered to the customers. Um, there was something else that was going on that I was going to tell you about. I can't remember what it was. Um, 
but so that's kind of where the farm is at right now i've got so many things that i need to do i've just been feeling overwhelmed but i was watching the treehouse knits podcast the other day and she was talking about these spinner apps where you can put different tasks on the spinner and um i think i'm going to do that with some of my stuff that i need to do around here because sometimes i just get so overwhelmed that i don't do anything <laughs> and that's kind of where i've been the last few days um so I think I'm going to get me one of those spinner apps and then that'll give me some direction and some focus. Um, and maybe I'll feel a little bit better about things, but I got some apples. My neighbors went to visit their fan. There's some, their kids in Chicago and they brought me back some apples. So I've got some apples I need to work up. I have to buy a few more cause I want to make some pie filling. Um, but yeah, that's kind of where the farm is right now. We got turkeys. We got the raccoon moved. Um, I'm, I'm still setting the trap for the next few days, though, because I want to make sure that wasn't the family business. Um, the ponies have been out in the pasture, loving it. I've just let them, I've just let them have free range of the pasture right now because the grass is not going to really cause them any problems. Sally's foot is fully recovered. She is walking around just fine on it now. And I caught the yard bunny. Or actually, the yard bunny caught himself. I had some cages sitting out there from the fair. And he got in one and shut the door on himself and couldn't figure out how to get out. So I caught the yard bunny caught himself. Uh, and I caught the yard chicken. So I put her. But I didn't put her in the coop. I had put her in a different pen. And that probably saved her life, to be honest. So, um, yeah. So that's kind of where we're at. That was kind of a lot. But that's kind of where we're at. So, um yeah, so let's come back and finish up with a few final thoughts. Okay, I wanted to come back with a few final thoughts. Um, you know, there's been a disturbance in the force lately for my life. And I'll, I'll be honest, it's got to do with the Supreme Court thing. And how Dr. Ford was treated. Um, again, it goes back to if people are speaking out, no woman in her right mind would invite the kind of public scrutiny that this woman has invited unless she felt like she had to say something, in my opinion. And you may not agree with me, and that's fine. Keep it to yourself. I'm just going to be honest. Keep it to yourself. Uh, if you post hateful comments on this video, I will delete them and I will block you <laughs> because I have been there. I have been there where I have been abused and mistreated. And it's humiliating. It's embarrassing. You're terrified. Or you just think that that's the way things are supposed to be because you don't know any better. Um, so you have to remember, if someone is speaking out in a provocative way, or is acting out in a provocative way, you have to put your empathy eyes and your empathy ears on. But also, we have to speak out. We have to stand up for injustice. We have to stand up and show kindness and compassion and empathy and, and stand up for what's right. So whatever the outcome of this, I hope that justice is served. Justice with a capital J who is an ancient Greek goddess. I hope that justice is served. And I hope that the next time someone comes to you and tells you something that is hard for them or scary for them, that you believe them. Okay? No one would purposely invite death threats or the kind of scrutiny that is happening right now to this woman. So, let's think about that the next time we try to victim blame or victim shame or post these arguments about, well, what if my husband's falsely accused? Well, if your husband is falsely accused, he will be proven innocent. You know, that's why we have a justice system. But when there are multiple people that speak out, you know, that becomes more, more of a compelling case against the person that's being accused. So, that being said, women, we have, to stay, we have to speak up. We have to speak up. We have to support each other. 
men. We have to speak up for the women in your life. I liked a meme that went around that said, and it said, she's somebody's mother, daughter, sister, or whatever, and mother, daughter, sister was scratched out, and the apostrophe S was scratched out, and it just said, she's somebody, and that's enough. So when people are being hurt or abused, children, women, elderly, when animals are being mistreated, we're their voice. So I found this poem that was going around. And I really liked it. I think, I don't remember who shared it first. I think maybe Byron Ballard who shared it first. She's a friend of mine. It's called Dangerous Coats. And it's about a woman called Sharon Owens. And I'm going to read it. And it's kind of where I have, as I've gotten older, and I've kind of, kind of embraced my croneness and my elder status in the community, that's the person I'm going to be. I'm going to wear a dangerous coat. Dangerous Coats. Someone clever once said women were not allowed pockets in case they carried leaflets to spread sedition, which means unrest. To you and me, it's a grandiose word for common sense, fairness, kindness, equality. So ladies, start sewing dangerous coats made of pockets and sedition. So my final thought today is I'm going to start wearing my dangerous coat. So, <laughs> and I'm going to use my empathy eyes and my empathy ears and open my empathy heart. Because it's a common sense word, or it's a grandiose word for common sense, kindness, fairness, and equality. That's a good kind of dangerous coat to me. So anyway, so until we talk next time, Willie's asleep here. I've bored him to tears. <laughs> so until we talk next time, I hope y'all are meeting your crafting goals and y'all be good to each other and take care of each other. And what, Willie? What? Peace out, y'all. Bye. Bye-bye, Willie. Bye-bye. Very good. Very good, Sadie. Come on, Joey. Yeah, good job. Hello there. Are you the one eating my chickens? Yes, you are. Well, I know. I'm going to move you so you won't get any more trouble here, okay? I know. You're scared. Don't worry. I'm not going to shoot you. I'm not going to shoot you. Okay. We're going to go on a trip. <laughs>